Okay, so I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about the power of one perspective. And I want to start by saying that right now we're all participating in something illegal. And that's because this fish in a fishbowl in Monza, Italy is illegal. And the lawmakers there have banned it because they felt that a little fish living in a little world with curved, the curved bowl would give it a warped perspective. So I want to pick up from a question that Stephen Hawking asked, which was, how do we know that we actually don't have a warped perspective? How do we know that we have this one true undistorted picture of reality? So I want to tell you guys a true story about Kenge. I love the story, actually, because Kenge is a pygmy who lives in the Congo. And in the 1950s, he was the assistant to a super famous anthropologist named Colin Turnbull. So Colin went to study the pygmies there because they've never left the forest environment, right? In a way, they live in their own little fishbowl. And so Colin took Kenge out one day, drove far, far, far afield, much further than Kenge would have ever walked. And this is what they saw. And Kenge turns to Colin and goes, Colin, what insects are those? And Colin looks at Kenge and goes, Kenge, those are buffalo. And Kenge, Kenge looks at Colin and bursts out laughing. He roars with laughter and he tells him not to tell such stupid lies, right? But the thing is, Kenge had never left his world before. He had nothing to compare to. He had lived in a world where there were only trees. And so he, as they were getting closer, driving closer and closer to these buffalo, Kenge thought these were insects turning into buffalo or magic buffalo, but either way, he wasn't going to get out of the car. So I'd say, in a way, we all have Kenge's eyes, because for the longest time, we all believed that the world was flat, right? You can't really trust your senses. For example, right now, we're all hurtling through space at 100,000 kilometers per hour, but none of us really feel that, right? And if I were out looking, this is a map from the 1800s, the square and stationary Earth. If I was actually just looking out at the world right now at a beach or something like that, I probably wouldn't be the first person to be like, you know, it's kind of it's more like a grapefruit than a pancake. Like, that wouldn't have been me. But of course, today, we know that the world is round. You guys have seen this image many times, even today. This is the blue marble. It is the most widely disseminated photograph on Earth, right? But the thing is, for my parents' generation, just half a human lifetime ago, this blew people's minds. They'd never seen the planet from space before, you know? And the thing about this image, too, is that we didn't even know what color our planet was until the late 1960s. We should remember that. Now, here's an even bigger fishbowl from much further, much further away. This is actually taken from 6 billion kilometers away. And it was taken by Voyager 1, 1990, on Valentine's Day at the request of Carl Sagan. So he asked NASA to turn their cameras back. And you can see inside that little blue circle is our planet. The original photo is 640,000 pixels. And Earth takes up 0.12 of a pixel. And so Carl Sagan said, all of human history has happened on that one tiny pixel, which is our only home. So that kind of makes you think, when you think of that tiny pixel that we live on, when you see this wide perspective, how absurd it is that we have all these borders and these boundaries and this crazy warfare and all that stuff. But in the meantime, let's just pop back into today and our world and our fishbowl. Back to my little fish, Luigi, here. <laughs> and ask another question that another famous scientist asked, which is, what does a fish know about the water in which it swims all its life? And if I were to ask my little fish friend, he would probably be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't even know that I'm in water. And I would say, in a way, we have that point of view as well. We don't know the water that we live in. But of course, we do live in some sort of ether, some sort of substance, right? We call them dimensions. And we live in time and space. But what do we know about time and space? You know, for time, for example, we know we have meetings, we have alarm clocks, we have to wake up in the morning. But it, there have been many different ways and many different points of view when it comes to time. So, for instance, the ancient Chinese in the Song Dynasty used to smell time. They had incense clocks. So imagine right now if this place smelled like lavender, and then all of a sudden it smelled like vanilla, and you're like, hey, I've got to go to my meeting. It's 4 o'clock, you know? Carl Linnaeus had another idea about time. This is a flower clock. So imagine the idea he planted a garden where you could look out at your garden, and depending what time the flowers opened, you would know what time of day it was. So this is everything from the morning glory to the evening primrose. 
Of course, there is another way that we've told time through most of Western civilization. We've used a sundial. But the thing to keep in mind with a sundial, of course, is at night, there is no time because there's no shadow. So you're not meeting anybody at 2.30 a.m. because you don't even know what time it is. But how did we come up with this idea? When did we all decide that we had to subscribe to master time? Because for the longest period of time, everybody had their own local time, right? So when did this all happen? Well, it was two dudes, Leonard Waldo and Samuel Langley. And they were two entrepreneurs. And they came up with a really great idea in the late 1800s. They decided to sell time signals. They sold them to railways. They sold them to states. They sold them to companies. But in order for this to be important, right, People had to believe in a new idea. So they came up with this super aggressive marketing strategy akin to what we would have with Nike today. And they came up with this word that didn't exist before the 18, late 1800s, punctuality. That's when that all started. That's when all of us had to learn to be on time. And that has been with us ever since.